I'd like to thank everybody uh, for being here and especially everyone who's traveled a long distance. Uh, I'd also like to apologize for the uh, you know, little bit of tardiness here. I think we're on Filipino time in, in Norfolk. Enough small talk. We have a good story for you guys today and I uh, kind of want to tell it. Long before the famous 1960s TV show or recent franchise of Tom Cruise movies, long before the catchy theme music, there was an original a Mission Impossible. It began, after all, with an impossible battle. Impossible to win, that is. While the rest of the free world crumbled beneath the Axis onslaught in the dark early days of World War II, the Philippines, though completely enveloped by a strangling naval blockade that was depriving its defenders of desperately needed weapons, medicine, and most importantly, food, refused to fall. There was a humiliating mass retreat into the Bataan Peninsula after a loss of majority of American air power in the archipelago that one officer would call a small Dunkirk. Approximately 100,000 Filipino and American troops held off a rampaging Imperial Japanese Army for approximately five months on the strength of promised reinforcements and supplies en route from the United States. Buoyed by reports of these relief convoys, they fought on with dogged determination, with obsolete weapons and materiel, in some accounts equipment from ammunition to medical supplies unpacked on Bataan was wrapped in newspapers with 1918 dates. They fought on, with half, on half rations and with dwindling medical supplies. They also fought on in an information vacuum with little news from the outside world. No letters from home, no star-studded U.S. show shows, no movies. This was not a war you saw in the Pacific on HBO's miniseries. Most importantly, they fought on alone together. If ever there was an army of irregulars, this was it. Constabulary troops, the native police force of the Philippines, and Filipino regulars from Manila, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, alongside planeless American pilots, as well as shipless sailors in the dense Bataan jungle. U.S. Marines, Navy Blue Jackets, side by side with Filipino air cadets and civilians in the foxholes and trenches on the bomb-created beaches and rocky ledges of the island of Corregidor. There were National Guard troops, tankers, anti-aircraft gunners, small rural towns in New Mexico, Wisconsin, Kentucky, Ohio, California, Minnesota, and Illinois, shoulder to shoulder with Igorots and Negritos and other tribesmen. The dog faces and doughboys of the All-American 31st Infantry Regiment, a unit previously known as the 31st Regiment due to its carousing prowess in Manila, were proving themselves to be combat soldiers too, of the highest caliber. They were the backbone of the Bataan forces. There was some hurried field training and combat experience had awakened the innate pride and latent warrior skills of thousands of Filipino reserve troops, the same individuals who had fled the battlefields of Luzon in haste during the mass confusion of December 1941, had, within a few short weeks in early 1942, become, in the words of one American officer, battle-hardened, vicious, disease-ridden, jungle-fighting experts. There was also the Philippine scouts, whose infectious, unswerving morale permeated the ranks across the peninsula. They continued their stalwart service. Tojo, count your men, the members of one scout battalion, artillery unit was overheard to shout in unison before, in the, before firing their 155 millimeter guns. After a loud crash reverberated off the green hills of Bataan, they shouted another order to the Japanese, count them again. The collective efforts of these men, ill-equipped, inexperienced, outgunned and surrounded, was nothing short of extraordinary, despite the odds they cobbled together impossible victories, places that most people have never heard of and you will never read about in history textbooks in our schools. Lyak Junction, the points, the pockets, Agaloma Bay, Subic Bay. Together they frustrated Japanese General Masahiro Hama and his Japanese 14th Army at every opportunity, but help would never come to the Philippines. Because of an Allied strategic mandate to defeat Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany first, the mostly inexperienced troops would be sacrificed for future victories. Says Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson, there are times when men must die. Frank Hewlett from United Press, one of the small handful of war correspondents covering the fighting in the Philippines, you could say he was embedded with MacArthur's command, was moved to pen the words that would forever be associated with the Philippines campaign. We're the battling bastards of Bataan. No mama, no papa, no Uncle Sam. No aunts, no uncles, no cousins, no nieces, no pills, no planes, no artillery pieces. And nobody gives a damn. Despite the fact that their government turned its back on them, the battling bastards of Bataan and the forces garrisoning Corregidor and the other islands of the archipelago thwarted Japan's plan to conquer the Pacific by selfishly sacrificing their blood to buy time for the Allied war effort to kick into high gear. 
General Homa, few people other than most uh, in-depth Philippine historians and military strategists know, have been given a 50-day deadline to conquer the Philippines. He missed it by 99 days. On April 9th and May 6th, 1942, respectively, the gaunt, stubble-bearded troops on Bataan and Corregidor, surrounded, starved, shell-shocked, and diseased, finally forced to lay down their arms. A few days later, much of the remaining organized U.S. and Filipino resistance did so too. But the fact that they had severely disrupted Japan's chronological timetable for conquest was not something that the men in the Philippines were aware of or even cared about at the time. The defeat in the Philippines was, and still is, the largest surrender in American military history. The next impossible mission is best summed up in one word, survival. After the fall of the Philippines, the gallant defenders were subjected to some of the most barbaric treatment ever afforded prisoners of war. There was, of course, the infamous Bataan Death March, a 60-mile forced evacuation out of the peninsula that saw an estimated 700 Americans and as many as 10,000 Filipinos killed in a variety of methods, beheading, stabbing by bayonet, rifle fire, some were buried alive. Then there were the horrors of squalid prison camps, O'Donnell, Cabanachuan, Bilibid, Palawan, and Davao, among others, where these individuals struggled to endure the unbearable. Antique diseases, said one historian, speaking of tuberculosis, diphtheria, beriberi, and others long ago conquered by modern medicine, were resurrected and ran rampant. Men starved on a pasty rice gruel called lugao. Beatings, torture, executions, and other indescribable atrocities were commonplace. Adherence to the rules of the conduct of war was rare. There was no concept of surrender, after all, in the Japanese code of conduct, so the Japanese despised any enemy who did. Such humiliation and mistreatment looked to be the norm rather than the exception for the prisoners in the Philippines, as long as they were under Japanese control. But how long would the Philippines remain under the Japanese boot? The Allies, concentrating their military might on the European, Mediterranean, North African theaters, as well as Nazi Germany, had all but forgotten the Philippines and remained ignorant of the nightmare unfolding in what Japan called its Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Other historians have called it the Far East Holocaust. In April 1943, a special group of individual heroes, determined to alert the world to what was taking place in Japanese-occupied territories, accomplished perhaps the most impossible mission of the entire war. They did something that no other mass group of prisoners of the Japanese could. They escaped. Under the noses of their captors, eight ingenious and determined U.S. Army, Navy, and Marine officers, two Army enlisted men, and two Filipino convicts, engineered the perfect escape plan. Their names were Lieutenant Commander Melvin McCoy, Major Steve Melnick, Captain William Edwin Dias, Lieutenant Sam Gratio, Lieutenant Leo Bolins, Captain Austin Schaffner, Lieutenant Jack Hawkins, Lieutenant Mike Dobrovich, Sergeant Paul Marshall, Sergeant Robert Spielman, and the two Filipino convicts, Benigno de la Cruz and Victor Humarong, escaped from the most unlikely of places. For all intents and purposes, the story of the Dapakal escape begins in November 1942. A detachment of 1,000 men, death march survivors, Corregidor comrades, traveled from Cabanachuan in Nueva Akiva province via railroad boxcars and then on foot to Manila, where they boarded the Erie Maru, an old rickety Japanese freighter that would transport them to Mindanao. After nearly 10 days, they landed on Mindanao at the pier of the Lasang Lumber Company near Davao and were marched approximately 20 kilometers through dense jungle to their new home, the Davao Penal Colony. Known by the acronym DAPACOL, the Penal Colony was a vast, supposedly escape-proof prison plantation built by the Commonwealth Government in 1932 to house violent criminals. Surrounded on all sides by an impenetrable swamp filled with Philippine crocodiles that reportedly grew to lengths of 10 feet or more, giant insects, and walls of kogan grass, a tall plant with blades of thick grass that grew from between 12 to 14 feet in height, even headhunters also uh, frequent in this area, reportedly. Dapakal was a Filipino version of Alcatraz, or Devil's Island. On the heels of their victory in the Philippines in 1942, the Japanese assumed control of the penal colony and decided to put several thousand of their new American captives to work. Upon their arrival, these prisoners were addressed by Major Kazuo Maeda, the Japanese commandant of the camp. Maeda was incredibly unhappy with the skinny, weak, poorly clothed prisoners lined up before him. He had asked for a detail of strong, healthy men to perform labor, but there were no strong, healthy men in this group of POWs. In fact, there were no strong, healthy POWs anywhere in Japanese hands. Still, Maeda would not alter his orders or expectations. Dapakal would be a profitable enterprise for the Japanese army. 
You are not here to lazy, he told him. You have been to a soft, used to a soft, easy life since your capture. 